So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Mohamed Khaira today. Um, I'm going to read your bio because it's so wonderful and I don't want to get anything wrong. Um, Mohamed is a legal manager at, at NIOM. Res he's responsible for working with external and internal stakeholders over 20 sectors to drive legal projects in the department's finance and transaction streams. He founded Egyptian Streets and led it to become one of the region's fastest growing media organizations and Egypt's leading independent English media organization. Mohammed was invited to be a keynote speaker at the opening ceremony of the World Youth Forum alongside Nobel Peace Prize winner Nadia Murad. In 2018, he was chosen among Forbes' 30 under 30 in media and marketing for his role in founding Egyptian Streets. And in 2019, he was awarded the Rising Star Award for Young Alumni by the University of Melbourne's Faculty of Art. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much. I am excited to be here. We went over Egyptian Streets as the independent. I'm just going to kind of reframe the organization to make sure that we um, are at a level footing. Um, Egyptian Streets is an independent, young, and grassroots news media organization aimed at providing readers with an alternate depiction of events that occur in the Egyptian and Middle Eastern streets and to establish an engaging social platform for readers to discover and discuss the various issues that impact the region. Um, we want to get into like the before. Um, so where were you, what were you doing before you started working on this project? Um, well, I started working on this project 10 years ago. Um, I was in university studying my undergraduate degree at the University of Melbourne, um, finishing up, uh, politics and media, uh, studies under a Bachelor of Arts. Um, I think I was in my second year at the time. And during that time, we'd uh, in Egypt uh, gone through um, the 2011 uprising. Uh, there'd been a lot of political change in the in the country, and of course, I was abroad. I was uh, very, very far away in Australia. Um, but as an Egyptian living abroad, I, I felt that um, you know my voice as an Egyptian abroad wasn't wasn't among the voices that were being listened to. Finally, after you know decades of of essentially an authoritarian regime. Um, and I felt that that applied to many other uh, Egyptians living abroad too. And in fact, I saw several friends and, and colleagues and so forth who, who were Egyptian, who lived abroad as well, start various blogs of their own, start talking more on social media and so forth. <clears throat> so I always wanted to create a blog at least that, that allowed me to express myself, even if no one necessarily uh, you know, Reddit or whatever it would just be out there on the internet, searchable, or at least like a personal diary. Uh, part of university had to start a, a blog to learn about blogging and, and you know, Tumblr and Twitter and all that um, when they were still, you know, in their early years. And um, I went to wordpress.com as part while sitting in class. Um, and the name Egyptian Streets just came to me. So um, that's that's where it started, I guess, uh, in, in a university class. And that's where where I was or what I was doing before I started yeah. working on it. Um, do you feel like the thumbprint of that class is really palpable in the way that Egyptian Streets operates? Or do you feel like if you created it in a different context, it would be different? I feel like if it wasn't for the class, I probably wouldn't have created it. Okay. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have had the the like you know when you always want to start something or do something like yeah. oh i want to start going you know to the gym or running or whatever it is yeah. or start reading books you need something to really push you and i think that was that one thing and you know makes you wonder if, if i'd ever have had that motivation otherwise um who are the five unlisted co-founders who you've met but in, um who you've never met but inform your work it's a tough one. Um, I think one of the the initial um, inspirations was Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post and how she managed to, you know, essentially change, uh, create a blog that ended up becoming a media network and an empire. Of course, she today isn't involved on the Huffington Post so much, um, but she's definitely one of the first early inspirations. Um, other people would generally... Um, be as I mentioned, just Egyptians living abroad. I think they their voices were were quite inspirational to me, and and I really wanted, you know, I initially really really listened to what people were saying and so forth. 
Um, and, you know, th that might not be from a business perspective, but it certainly helped from a content strategy and content direction perspective. Um, other than that, I think that's kind of a, a changing theme uh, or a changing names over, over the years. Um, definitely other regional or global uh, publications or digital media organizations that have done the same thing. So looking at how their founders uh, approach things and how they took things and being inspired by them. Um, overall, always changing, um, never stagnant. Right, right. Um, what are some of the things that created friction that slowed you down before you launched? Um, I said, well, I'll take this question as rather than before I launched, because I literally just entered the website name and right. <laughs> clicked enter and that was that. But rather, uh, I'll take that as throughout the growth phase and, and getting to where we are today. And I should add that when I did launch it as a blog in 2012, it wasn't for uh, a year uh, where I switched gears into a more objective kind of website where my opinion was kind of taken out and it became kind of a, a media website. And then a year later was when we founded an actual media company. Um, but I think one of the, the biggest things that, caught, that created friction throughout that phase, throughout that growth phase, and even continue to create friction today um, is resourcing and support. I think there's unfortunately very limited support and resources available for independent media organizations. Um, often the, I mean, in a, in a country like Egypt, at least, um, the, the media climate is increasingly controlled by business interests, by government interests and so forth, leaving very minimal space for um, smaller independent publications to just do journalism. Um, instead, you kind of have to do journalism and PR, and journalism and advertising and so, and so forth. So I think that's, that's definitely one of, or two of the, the, the major things that have created friction. And then pushing on a point that you mentioned earlier, why, um, why did you try to take your voice out of it for about a year before like reinserting it? Oh, no, I, I took it out entirely <laughs> since, oh, okay. uh, since 2013, yeah. I mean, it, it used to be, like, when, when I first started, it was literally just a blog. It was just me <laughs> posting my own views, my own opinions, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the first article that we published, uh, that I published on Egyptian Streets, was an article that uh, was highly critical of the conditions in Egypt at the time, back in 2012, and so forth. Um, today, we, of course, still have... Uh, voices of people, our writers, including myself, being shared on the platform, but that's through a more, you know, clearly flagged opinion section, right? This is an opinion piece, this is an opinion article, and it doesn't go into, you know, doesn't necessarily um, color our other articles, our feature articles, our news articles, and so forth. Um, and the main reason for that is to create an objective platform that's for everyone, that's accessible to everyone, that provides information to people and lets them dissect that information, engage with it, have conversations about it without us shoving down their throat what they should believe, what they should think and so forth. Although there are certain, obviously, um, areas where you kind of have to be more forceful with, with the message you're trying to sell. Right, right. Um, I'm going to move us to like the during phase because I think we're, the conversation is like moved to, in that direction. Um, who are the early believers and team members that shaped the project? So probably the earliest one is one of our co-founders, uh, Mustafa Amin. Uh, he's uh, also the founder of Breadfast, which is a, a one of Egypt's leading startups today, actually. Um, he was at the time working at Aswat Masreya, which was a Reuters funded journalism project in Egypt. Um, it was a publication that ran for a few years. They shut it down um, in 2015, perhaps. Um, and he reached out in late 2012, oh no, late 2013, saying, I see this as becoming something more than, than what it is. And uh, him and, uh, and, uh, he connected me with someone called Asim Imam, who's the founder of a startup as well in Egypt called El Coach. Um, and they both really believed that Egyptian streets could be something more, could be a media organization. Um, so they became the first co-founders of Egyptian streets. And together we founded our first corporate presence um, back in 2014. And that support probably pushed me to take it 
further than what it was back in 2013. Um, I want to actually kind of like deviate a little bit. How, how, um, how do you manage Egyptian streets now with like your full-time work? Is it something that you kind of like, you're kind of constantly working on or is it, you know, if you're passionate about it, you make time, what's that like for you right now? Um, it's, it's definitely a difficult, um, it's kind of a full time commitment yeah. that exists there where you fit it wherever you can. So whether that's, you know, quick uh, message here and email there during lunch break, or when you're going to the toilet or, or whatever it is, um, and, and in the evenings and so forth. However, what has really helped is that we have a team of uh, very dedicated, passionate and hardworking individuals, all based in Cairo who are running the day-to-day things. So the day-to-day editing, the day-to-day art uh, writing, the researching, the reporting, the social media and so forth. So um, that didn't always exist. So in the earlier days when funding and resourcing was a lot more limited, I was doing everything. So for the first few years of Egyptian streets, I was, whether I was studying or working, um, I was doing that full time, but also doing Egyptian streets as writing, the editing, the posting on social media and so forth with the support of some great volunteers, um, incredible volunteers who helped uh, get us to where we are today. Um, but they were volunteers. You know, at the end of the day, we we didn't hire our first uh, paid uh, employee until late 2014. And that was just one individual. Um, and we remained as a small team of, you know, between two to four people until 2019, 2020, um, which is, which is a long, long time period. Um, today we have more than 10 people working with us, um, on either part-time, full-time and so forth. So it's a juggle, but thanks to the people who, who work with us today, it's, it's been made a lot more possible. And then can I push on another point that you mentioned, um, which is funding? Like, what has the funding process looked like? Where have you been sourcing funders? Is it something that, like, is mostly in, like, the startup environment? Or is it something that's, like, more grant-based? Or how, and and also just, like, in general, panning out, like, what's been your funding strategy or process? Like, has it been, like, very specific about where you get funds? Sorry, this is, like, a very... Yeah, no, no. It's, it's certainly more difficult than a startup. So I think with, with mo- let's say you have a startup idea. Um, uh, let me try to think of one right now. Um, we'll take um, Kareem, right? The, the Uber equivalents that's a startup right. that's now acquired by Uber. Um, that had a very tangible service. It was selling customers. It was getting paid customers and so forth. And revenues coming in that were sustainable. You could project revenues yeah. and so forth. With media, or at least in my experience, it's it's not so simple, right? You have right. Uh, today we have four hundred more than four hundred thousand followers on Facebook, but that doesn't mean that's four hundred thousand paying followers on Facebook. That doesn't mean anything really at the end of the day, other than you have reach and you have engagement and you have blah 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 and so forth. But it's not as tangible as selling a service or selling a product or or getting people to subscribe to a product. Um, so from that sense. Um, despite early day efforts to try to, you know, go down the angel investor route and so forth, that that was very difficult because they'd always ask us, what are you selling? What are the projections and so forth? And at least back back then, subscriptions, for example, were off, you know, off the table. That, that's not yeah. something you could even consider back in, yeah. in 2014, especially for a small publication. Um, we applied... Uh, or, I mean, our, our first initial injection of funds came in 2014 through an accelerator. Um, we did that in Germany. So we applied for an accelerator, managed to secure um, 25,000 euros at the time, mm-hmm. um, which helped us set up our first corporate presence Again, helped us hire our first individual and so forth and do things like revamp the website from, you know, just a basic blog to something a bit more and so forth. Um, so that was kind of one of the first areas of funding. Um, second is probably advertising revenue is, is quite important. Um, it's, it's not as, as, uh, well, it varies from, from like from platform to platform and and where the source of advertising is coming from. One of the more traditional ones is Google ads, Facebook ads. So those are the ads you see when you visit an article that just appear on their own based on your web browsing history and so forth. Um, that's an important one, but not 
hugely impactful one because for a publication based in Egypt, the value of an Egyptian reader is minimal compared to the value of an American reader. So if we were an American website based in America, getting largely American views, we'd be getting a lot more advertising revenue through Google ads, for example, because they value an American viewer more than an Egyptian viewer. Um, that's the second one. And then the third one would probably be um, just uh, more partnerships and editorial kind of advertorial uh, uh, relationships where you work with a brand to promote their story in an organic way that reaches certain audiences and so forth. And that's probably the most important source of, of revenue today. Um, of course, you're competing in a market where we're an English only publication. So competing in a market that has, and that's largely Arabic speaking. Um, so for most publications that are Arabic uh, publications, they're, they're getting far more, more visitors and viewers and so forth because they're reaching more people. However, we have a very specified audience that, you know, certain brands find very valuable because they're, they're the target audience for them. Um, and then uh, generally speaking, although the angel investor kind of route, like I said, didn't work out, we did manage to find someone who's, who's one of our shareholders today who was very supportive and has helped us uh, quite a lot over the last couple of years, uh, purely on yeah, that kind of angel investor basis. Right, right. Um, kind of pressing into that a little bit more, um, do you find that most of your readership is based outside of Egypt or is it kind of like 50-50 or like, have you noticed like there are like trends, like some at some points there's like more Egyptian readers and then sometimes it's like more Egyptians living abroad or how, how's that split or that ratio been? Yeah, it's it's interesting. And I think over the last three or so years, we've developed a much larger American audience for some reason. Okay. I'm not like it, probably Egyptians living in America, um, mm -hmm. which which is was one of the, the main countries people live in. Um, so the website today is the, purely the website, ignoring social media followers and so forth. Um, we get around 40% of readers to the website itself from Egypt, um, followed by perhaps high 20s or low or low 30s from America. Um, and then from countries like Australia, the UK, um, France, Germany, Saudi Arabia, countries where you'd expect Egyptian expats to be living. Um, that's, that's what our audience looks like today. Social media is predominantly Egyptian, I'd say. Um, so the majority, uh, perhaps like 60, 70%, so it's a little larger than the website, live in, live in Egypt or um, uh, in the region. And then again, followed by the US, uh, UK, Australia, um, and other countries where there's large Egyptian communities. Got it, okay. Um, I'm going to use another slide because I think it ties into a little bit of what we're talking about with, with regards to like phases. Um, if you had to explain the project in phases, how would you describe each phase? Um, I'm assuming phases as in where we were, where we are today, is that, or? Yeah, kind of like, oh, there was a phase where, you know, we um, mostly operated independently. There was a phase where we were like, starting to grow i mean i think you were kind of alluding to it a little bit you had like this growth yeah. phase um yeah. where your first full-time employee was in 2014 so there was mm. like special phase so like could you map up like the the starting the establishment the, and i think something that you were also talking about is like you after the accelerator in germany there was a moment where you were able to establish corporate presence could you even like elaborate a bit on like what the corporate presence looked like for your organization? Was it like establishing a physical office? Was it establishing a particular yeah. mode of operating? So that can... well, the main thing for a corporate presence was suddenly we had to pay tax. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Always... um, but no, it's it, it, no, I understand now. Um, well, I guess the, the first phase was the blog phase where it was just me whenever I'm free, whenever, well, initially, whenever I was required to by my university, I had to publish articles on, on the website. Um, that was, that lasted a few months in 2012 um, and was followed in January, 2013 by me establishing our Facebook page. Um, that was because I'd visited Egypt and I started to think that Facebook was, was quite an integral tool to promoting information in an easy and accessible way. And frankly, it was just easier to 
share things and post status updates on Facebook rather than a website. They got it to people's timelines right in front of them rather than trying to get them to click through something. Um, so Facebook phase was quite important and it's probably what got us to where we are today, quite, quite importantly, um, because in June 2013 was when the uh, Facebook page kind of blew up um, by, so from January 2013 to June 2013, I'd accumulated 3000 followers. Um, and then we had the June 2013 uprising in Egypt. Um, and what I did at the time was try to tell people in English through simple status updates on Facebook what was happening in Egypt in very simple terms uh, on a moment to moment basis. So I was posting dozens of posts a day during the, the two weeks of the uprising uh, on Facebook saying, you know, it's 12 p.m. right now. Uh, this is what's happened. You hear the top bullet, you know, headlines, blah, 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 blah. And that came from translating Arabic and confirming the news as much as I could and so forth. And that two weeks of work led the Facebook page to grow to 30,000 followers. And that was a huge boost. That, that showed me that there's something more here. Right. This, uh, this can be more than just a blog. This can be more than just you know, a website I'm just doing. There's an actual need for an English media source in Egypt that's independent, that also leverages social media at a time when little media organizations were, were leveraging social media. In fact, our Facebook page by the end of 2013 had more followers than some of the top publications today um, that, that existed, the, the names you know, and so forth. Um, so it was quite an important tool. And that started, I guess, the next phase, which was get funding phase to build a more, you know, a, a proper website uh, to invest in setting up, you know, ads and so forth, um, which came with the accelerator in Germany. Um, we, ne we never had an office and we don't have one at the moment. So that has never been part of our incorporation or, or our development. Um, in fact, everything has been entirely online, entirely remote. Um, in 2014, we had people working volunteering from all over the world. It wasn't just Egypt, it was people, whether they're in the Netherlands and America and Canada and UAE and so forth. Um, but that, that phase was important to give us slightly more credibility, get our name out there and to build our website. Um, the next phase I would, I would say didn't uh, take place for a few years. And again, I was doing all this while studying full-time, working part-time and so forth. Um, but it probably took place when we found our uh, latest co-founder or share or angel investor who decided to fund a team, right? To, you know, so we can hire more than just one person. Um, and that's when we hired three people. And I was like, wow, I can have three people working on Egyptian streets. Um, and that's when we started, I started, you know, stepping away a little bit, being able to delegate more work, not having to write most of the articles myself. Um, and developing more of a team environment where we had a consistent team working together to develop uh, content, produce content, and so forth. Um, that phase, uh, again, due to the lack of resources, ended up with us largely becoming news providers. So we were essentially just providing news on what was happening in Egypt rather than telling stories. Um, and it wasn't until perhaps three or three-ish years ago where we shifted from being a platform that predominantly shares news to a platform that predominantly shares original stories. Um, so those are feature articles, those are original reporting uh, back to articles. Um, we've started looking uh, in the last year or two at multimedia production and multimedia content. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we are today, uh, where we're trying to diversify our services, our content and so forth in order to reach new audiences and in order to unlock new revenue generation sources. And then that would, that storytelling phase is where you're at now, you would say. Yeah. Storytelling plus growth, I think is, is, is where we're at now. Yeah. Um, pushing a little bit on that point. Um, something that I'm really interested in when it comes to like founding and expansion is like, there's like this moment that founders have of like, 
when they hire a full-time person that it's just like, okay, now I'm like responsible for someone's life, right? Like their, their salary is hinged on my work. Their, you know, um, their career hinges on how this goes. Did you feel that when you started hiring people, like there's like this new sense of responsibility or was it more like, oh, it's a relief, like it's less work for me or even just like the establishing of a team culture, like how were you thinking about that? Because it goes from like one person's kind of personality to like a whole group's kind of culture fit. Um, what was that process like? Yeah, it's certainly one of the more overwhelming things, I think. Um, it's, you know, whenever we've reached periods of stagnation, for example, or where we're not growing and we said we're actually losing money or it's just becoming not viable, it's often been a battle of, well, why are we doing this, right? Um, and there are two reasons. One is for the community. Um, without us, uh, unfortunately, in Egypt, there aren't many alternatives. You know, we're not in a country where there's dozens of publications and they're all out there available, sharing information, telling stories and so forth. No, if we disappeared, it leaves almost no one available to fill that void. Um, so that's that's one reason. The second reason is, of course, a team because you feel kind of a responsibility for the team you've built. You feel a responsibility for the people who work for you. Um, and it kind of becomes, you know, that they become why, in addition to the community, you're doing this. Um, it's certainly one of the more challenging things when you've started something independently and you've grown into a team because then you have to consider other areas like performance, for example, um, and how to manage performance, how to manage team issues, team team conflict, and so forth. And I think that's certainly one of the things you, or at least in my perspective, I learn on the job, um, because you know larger corporations have HR teams, right? They have all this experience and skill, and that they can bring on to kind of manage these these processes, manage hiring, manage performance, manage development, and so forth. While a smaller kind of organization doesn't have that privilege. And so you kind of have to um, try to create the best culture, the best team you can. Um, and, you know, one of the ways of doing that is main of, is ensuring it's a safe enough space for people to communicate any issues they have and to openly discuss and to openly, you know, come to you with, you know, concerns, uh, areas of development and so forth. Um, the, uh, so that's phase uh, four. Um, and then, yeah, I guess like we have like this phase five, um, that you were talking about, which is like when you move from a news provider to sharing original stories, and then you mentioned multimedia content. So I have two questions there. The first is like, how has it been gaining expertise in the media industry? Cause I'm hearing you talk about it and you're using like very like industry terminology. Um, has that been something that's just been like a learn? Like, have you not, I, I, I don't want to say have you enjoyed it, but um, what's that process been like of just like gaining maybe some very industry specific knowledge that might be different or crosses over to your, you know, your day job, or if it doesn't, can we talk about that as well? Um, but what's that process been like? Is it just kind of like tapped a curiosity that you've always have, or is it just mm -hmm. like very like um, functional knowledge for you? Yeah, I mean, there's different sources. I think one of them is I'm interested in the media. So I've been, you know, consuming media from from the news media from, from a pretty young age. And um, even today, I keep up with what, you know, publications around the world are doing and how they're doing it and so forth. Um, the other thing is, trial and error, really, like you well, I started a Facebook page. I didn't know what to do with a Facebook page. I didn't read up about how to manage a Facebook page before I started it. The same with Twitter, the same with Instagram and so forth. But you're kind of inspired by what others around you are doing, what other content creators, what other publications are doing. And um, you try to find your own way to, um, like if, if you read a lot about how um, soul like creators, individual creators, um, get more followers it's often that they find a niche right that they try to grow their their audience through that niche and, and develop that way and that's something we found with egyptian streets initially where our niche was english content uh easily uh accessible um easily uh, uh found on social media um and addressed largely to 
either Egyptians living abroad or Egyptians in Egypt who prefer to consume their media in English or foreigners wanting to know more about Egypt. Um, the third thing is I have kept, uh, like I've done a few uh, short educational courses from time to time. Um, I've attended various conferences and meetings and so forth where, you know, you learn more about the latest trends, what's happening, particularly in the revenue generation space, how are publications around the world um, expanding their revenue generation capabilities and so forth. And that, that helps a lot. Um, recently I did a course on marketing and, uh, you know, it's, it's some of the most basic marketing things you probably learn if you did a marketing degree, but I never come across it. And of course, some of it was stuff I was doing, but I didn't know I was doing it. And now that I know I'm, you know, what it is, I can, you know, fine tune that and do it better and so forth. Right. Or just like build it into like a cohesive strategy. Um, yeah. The other point that I wanted to ask about is like you said you were a news provider and then you moved to sharing original stories so i can imagine why the reason is but i do want you to kind of like explicitly say like why you've moved into original stories or why you're looking into expanding into the multimedia content um and the the second question is i, I guess a little m more like covert but um what's that process even been like like i think it, it, like what i can imagine is like it must be empowering to give people the space and the freedom and the um platform to kind of like expand and work through ideas themselves but what's that process been like to kind of like see a team begin to like really dive into like original news stories so i think the first question was why right like, why like, yeah and what's it <laughs> um the i mean the the main why is to differentiate who we are right like it's why would you know why would they consume news from us rather than state media that's al ahram which is available in english and, and is you know a news provider in english you know yes we were doing in my opinion the news better in terms of we were taking the news presenting it in a more simpler way providing enough context and so forth but again like if you're just there for the information you'll just go read it somewhere else so that 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 was one of the main whys it, we didn't have a voice of our own if people thought about egyptian streets what did they think that's what i kept in mind and that's why we wanted to you know go down that route of storytelling and so forth the other thing is that's what i always wanted in the first place i wanted egyptian streets to be a platform a website a, you know whatever it is for anyone to use to tell their stories to share their experiences to um to use it uh, to advance a uh, cause, whatever it is. So that really fit in well with the storytelling. So often when we today have uh, positions uh, available, we, you know, like many other publications say, we have a culture editor or writer uh, position available. We have a politics and society writer available. And people apply to those roles based on their interests, based on what they think they can provide, based on what they want to do and so forth. Um, so really it was about um, going back to the main reason of founding Egyptian Streets, which was to have a platform available to anyone to share their stories. Um, for the how we got there, uh, there wasn't necessarily a kind of light switch moment where, where it happened. It kind of happened progressively. A large part of it was actually due to having a committed team. So a paid team of you know, part-time and full-time employees rather than relying on volunteers. Um, that means you can have a system in place, a process in place and so forth where you can actually say, okay, you're hired on this basis to write X amount of news stories, but Y amount of original stories, for example. Um, and that, that was quite important um, because when you have volunteers, you're kind of just trying to fill the gaps as much as you can and often that's right. you know in whatever way uh, possible rather than trying to think more strategically you know from a content strategy perspective um i'm going to kind of like guide us back to a question that we were just kind of touching on which was like oh you tried a facebook page and you know the first time you went on twitter it was like an experiment for you so what were the most instructive failures or turning points um in the establishment of egyptian streets Interesting um, question. I think um, 
probably one of the most instructive failures was earlier this year, I'd say, um, which was when kind of a wake up call that we needed to quite immediately diversify our revenue generation sources. Like there was a bit of a period of stagnation where, you know, I personally relied on our angel investor to continue funding us every month, you know, (laughs) without really looking into it much. And you kind of end up falling into that comfort zone where, you know, things are, you know, they're not growing necessarily, but they're not, you know, failing. You're, you're going along, you're doing what you're doing. And that's easy to fall into when you have another job, (laughs) when you're working full time on another job and this isn't your, you know, main money making source. Uh, I personally don't make any money from Egyptian streets. So this is, you know, one of the main reasons that probably happened, but that kind of, you know, when you start realizing, actually, this is not sustainable, this person is not going to exist forever is when, um, we really quickly had to look into that multimedia, for example, uh, content uh, option, um, started looking into uh, a variety of, of, of opportunities to kind of grow Egyptian streets. Um, and it came with us also expanding our team. So as I mentioned, we were largely four to three to four people over the past few years, and today we're more than 10. And that growth uh, to uh, at one point, it was up to 14 people um, happened in the last 12 months. Um, so that was um, both kind of, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily a failure as much as it was, like I said, a, a wake up call that things are going to fail. So better, better get, get a, get a hang on it. Um, turning points that probably, probably be the phases I mentioned earlier, you know, mm-hmm. um, the setting up of the Facebook page, the, uh, going through that and, and, you know, the, the 2013 coverage, um, the setting up of the, of the media, uh, uh well, applying for the accelerator and being successful in the accelerator in 2014. Um, and then the more recent turning point would be um, this year, probably where we're looking to expand into more communication services, um, but we're also uh, successful with the application for the Google News uh, Innovation Challenge, uh, which is going to enable us to do quite a few exciting things. Um, including the potential introduction of subscription, reader subscription uh, uh, model. So that's probably the latest turning point. Um, Were there critiques of the project that influenced your work, both external or internal? There's always critiques, I think. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned, the, the shift to storytelling, I mean, part of, Part of the reason for that was also, you know, hearing criticism that, well, it's just a news platform, like there's nothing more it's really offering. Um, there's, uh, that, that's probably the, the main, the main critique, I think, that influenced our work these days. Otherwise, we're generally quite open to what the community is saying. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's certainly critiques that come from a variety of sources that try to prevent your work, um, but um, in a way, I guess, keeps you, you know, more committed and, and dedicated to what you're doing. Um, but that, that would probably be the main, the main influential critique, which is, you know, it's just news. We want stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are some projects you have for other people who are doing similar work? You have to really stick in there. Really, <laughs> like it, it's not something you. If you're starting, for example, today, it's not something you can try for a month and then, you know, expect results in a month. Mm-hmm. You, similar again to individual creators, you need to find your niche. You need to find what you're good at and what people want from you, or at least feel is missing and which you can provide. Um, that's probably the main thing. The other thing would be to be open and be following trends. So trends on social media, trends in marketing, trends in uh, revenue generation, as I mentioned several times, um, because that's, that's very crucial and trying to get ahead of those trends being, you know, uh, an early adopter, even if that, let's say a new platform comes in and one of the latest ones is be real, for example, um, let's say be real ends up being this was more focused on, on a platform that, that media platforms could use getting onto that, even if it means, even if that platform fails and shuts down and ends up being nothing, but 
why not? You know, you, you could be an early adopter and end up being quite successful on that platform. Um, how do you quantify achievement and what does success look like for you or what are you proud of? Look, for me, quantifying achievement comes down to how the community and your team sees what you've created, um, how people generally react when when you tell them about you know what you're doing or what it is you've created, or um, generally if you overhear them and so forth. I think that's probably one of the main things where you know you can see that an impact is being had um, on someone, you know, even if it's a small group of people. And I think that that probably is to me is how I would quantify achievement. Of course, from a business perspective, then you look at money and revenue generation and so forth. But that's, you know, for example, for different streets, we've never really had that. <laughs> it's, it's never a business, you know, and, until very, very recently, it hasn't been one of the main ways we've quantified achievement at all. Instead, we've looked at what is the impact we're having in terms, like if, if you look at social media reach, engagement, you know, uh, are people being driven to do something because of what we've posted about and so forth. Um, and then what am I proud of? Probably linked a bit to that community point where, um, when we, when we share certain stories and people take action, I think that's, that's very, um, that's very important. Um, and it makes a difference. And I think a few years ago, we shared a story of someone who, you know, who, uh, had saved a woman from sexual assault and then got killed. Um, we shared that story and then the community asked us to do a GoFundMe for them. So we did, and thousands of people donated. And I think that, that showed me that we've really built a community to be proud of. And that's, that's, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main reasons we continue to exist today. Yeah. Um, this is a big question, but what did you fundamentally misunderstand about the problem you were solving? Um, probably the importance of, of money, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the importance of, of trying to monetize things. I think, yeah. um, seeing the, you know, seeing that it, it is a, you know, in similar ways to other startups that this is a product at the end of the day, the yeah. content we're providing is a product. Um, it's not just, um, information that's important and impactful and has a place in society, but it's also a product and that, you know, seeing in that way is quite important for you to actually continue to tell those stories to have that impact and so forth. Um, I'd say that's kind of, yeah, one of the main fundamental misunderstandings from early days. Um, I want to pan us out a little bit before kind of like moving forward um, through the kind of like last few structured questions. Um, the first is like, with your legal background, does that influence your work at all? Or do you see them as like very separate things? There's not much crossover. Um, it influences my work from only for, uh, in some, some scenarios. Um, so for example, you know, having studied some media law and, and gone through law school, I understand a bit more about defamation, for example. So mm -hmm. being a bit more sensitive to how we report certain information uh, to avoid defamation, um, to avoid uh, certain legal issues we might fall in as a result um, of the or of, of the way a story is being presented or told. I think that's probably the main influence. The other one is possibly more on a businessy side, where you know if we're entering into contracts or MOUs or whatever it is, knowing you know having a better understanding of what it is we're doing and how we're doing it and so forth. Um, other than that, probably not much of an overlap. Okay. Um, Actually, stakeholder management comes in. <laughs> you, you manage stakeholders quite a lot as a lawyer. Right. And I think that's quite important to, from a, from a media or a journalist perspective. I think that's something um, people tend to be surprised by when they work on like nonprofits or like more mission oriented work is just like how much you're like managing finances and how much you're managing relationships and how much like you need 
to be really good at that, to be able to make sure that like the work that you're maybe more, not more interested, but like the work that you philosophically are interested in doing hinges on the success of this other thing. Um, and how hard it is to kind of like navigate those two at the same time. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask is, um, how do you deter, like at this point, you know, you have a lot of writers on staff, but I noticed that you still publish articles and you still write a lot. Um, what determines what articles you're willing to write now? Like I know that you wrote recently about um, a new TV show in Egypt, um, which is like the same actress from Anai Zed Yo is. Um, and I wanted to hear like, what made you want to write that article? Is it just things that you're thinking about in general? Is it things that like... Um, I kind of just like that pique your interest and you feel like, oh, I need to write. Or it's like, and even like just a, that's one question. And then the macro question to that is like, what things do you find yourself very compelled to write at this point in time? And do you have a particular process for it? I think in terms of why often when I write, it's spontaneous. It's it's okay. not planned or I'm like, hmm, I have a feel like I want to write this. Okay. Um, but honestly, it's, you know, the having a team now and being able to step away from doing literally the day-to-day -day writing. Um, and I probably wrote hundreds of articles for Egyptian streets in the early days, um, all under the Egyptian streets, you know, acronym, um, yeah. alias, sorry, rather than my own alias, often because there were news. You know, like I, I didn't think that needed to be coming for me. Um, you, well, during that phase, you kind of get burnt out. Like you kind of, you know, you lose that creativity and you feel like writing is an obligation and so forth. Um, nowadays, I'm also very busy uh, managing more, far more of the business and the finance and, and whatnot and the you know, strategy of, of Egyptian streets rather than content side. Um, and so I write only when I'm particularly passionate about something and think that my voice adding to the topic can either be interesting or have a particular impact. Um, 9.53 so like, um, let's, let's, for example, take, uh, let's, uh, one article I've been considering lately has been, and I haven't done this, has been in relation to tourism um, and the state of tourism in Egypt. So I thought of uh, lately writing an opinion piece kind of addressed to the Minister of Tourism, right? The new minister, we just had a new Minister of Tourism about how things are, who, you know, how certain things need to change and so forth. Coming from the editor-in-chief of a publication probably stands out more than from someone who isn't the editor-in-chief because it kind of ends up representing the publication in, in a way. Um, other than that, like I mentioned, inspiration, like just, just feeling like I can write when I'm passionate about something in particular rather than being forced to write about it. Um, I don't remember what the second question was, sir. <laughs> um, what, what's your process for writing? Like, is it, are you like someone who has to like do a bunch of drafts? Is it like, yeah, um, right. no, yeah. no, no structure. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I want to write something, I will sit down and do it and finish it in that session often. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, unless it's something. So when I, uh, uh, earlier this year, I wrote an article for Netflix for their publication um, mm -hmm. That was something that was more challenging, I felt, because I got asked to do something. Again, it, it's writing because you're kind of forced to rather than I was inspired to write that article. Um, and in that perspective, in that, in that, in that scenario, um, it took a lot more time where I had to sit, you know, and try to do it over multiple sessions because I didn't have that inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, I felt the pressure of oh i'm submitting this to another publication so i have to get it right so right, right. Uh, but otherwise on a general basis spontaneous i think just sit down and do it um what's the next thing you're interested in for egyptian streets like what's the next big thing that you're either trying to navigate i know you mentioned multimedia content is that really where you're like heads at or how are you kind of like envisioning this part of it so what's next? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were selected for the Google News Innovation Challenge uh, in July this year. Um, and that is allowing us to explore a few new things. 
Um, one, as I mentioned, is a subscription model. Um, at the very least, uh, introduce some sort of registration on our website, whether it's free, whether it's paid, that's something we're still uh, considering and we'll need to analyze with um, you know, what impact that will have on people accessing information in a country where that information is not necessarily readily available and so forth. Um, so that's that's one thing. The second thing is we're looking more into communication services. So kind of using our expertise to support um, various organizations or you know businesses or companies or whatever um, with their communications. So that could be drafting press releases, that could be um, drafting blog articles for their websites, uh, posts for the LinkedIn and so forth. Um, the third thing would be uh, kind of tapping into the educational space. So trying to uh, you know, transfer knowledge uh, in relation to, di to digital media uh, to young uh, Egyptians who are interested in digital media and journalism. Um, so part of the Google uh, challenge, um, we'll be launching a platform where we will you know, produce a course on digital media and have that available to, to people to essentially uh, register for and learn skills that they may not necessarily get at university or perhaps they're in high school and they want to learn you know, a bit more about digital media early on for whatever reasons. Um, and then the fourth thing is also part of the Google project. Um, a lot of the content today is quite Cairo focused, um, which is natural because Cairo has a huge population. Um, it's it's the center of business and, and so forth, but it doesn't reflect all of Egypt. So one of the things we'll be doing is going to each governorate in Egypt, um, or to the, to the best uh, extent we can, um, and uh, sharing stories from each of those places. Um, and that's going to be through written content, through a podcast, through video content, and so forth, kind of tapping into that multimedia um, sphere. Um, in addition to enabling us to kind of set that up for the potential subscription model, you know, where we have kind of premium content available for people who register. Um, that's so exciting. And I have so many more questions about that, but I Super. think I have to move us to the quick Q&A because we got two minutes left. Um, what are you reading or watching right now? Um, what am I, I'm certainly not reading anything right now. Um, watching, I... What am I watching? I just finished Dahmer, uh, the latest Dahmer, Jeff Dahmer series on Netflix, which was a pretty twisted series. Uh, that's that's probably my answer for that. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day? Um, I would love to spend a day uh, at, rather than a particular individual, but spend a day at a well-established media organizations such as the Washington Post and New York Times, just to see how their day-to-day -day operations go. Um, what do most people misunderstand about your work? Uh, most people think we're either anti-state or pro-state, um, rather than just consider, you know, rather than just see that we're giving information to people so that they can make their own informed decisions about what's happening in the country. Um, whose work do you admire and are inspired by? I, it's no one in particular. Um, it's more of a, you know, a variety of people. Um, I think it's, it's other smaller publications around the world who are doing a great job in their markets and in their, in their, uh, communities. Um, that's probably who I, you know, most, most am inspired by. Um, that brings us to time. Um, if you want to follow Hamid, uh, he's on Twitter and Instagram and Egyptian Streets also has their own platforms that you can follow. Um, please leave us feedback on optikra.com. Was this good? Which I'll enter into the chat as well. Um, and stay in touch. Uh, we, um, have a new uh, platform to keep people connected. So be sure to follow that through afikra.com and uh, stay in touch with us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, thank you everybody for coming.